What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Ole Quist Sorensen, and we speak about the demystification of visual collaboration. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, why don't you visit workshops.work and download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy. Hello, Ola, and welcome to the show. Hello, Miriam. I am a big fan of your book and the online materials about visual collaboration. So I'm curious to explore and demystify it together with you. Well, thank you. That's good to hear. And um, I'm happy to see how far we can go in the demystification. But uh, let, let's see. And um, yeah, I'm looking very much forward. So where shall we start? <laughs> let's start at the beginning. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? Well, I think I have, ever since I took the education that I took, a uh, three-year education in, in Denmark called the Chaos Pilots, uh, Pilots <laughs> of Chaos, which was a very new invention in 1998, where nobody was making schools like that. It was a school devoted to entrepreneurship. Uh, consulting, process facilitation, and facilitation. So I've understood later that very few other educations actually spend that much focus on what happens in the group, what happens in the room. And it was three years of experimenting with very few textbook, a lot of learning by doing with external experts from around the world. It's an it's a international school these days, and in the beginning it was as well. So I think from an early age, uh, I joined in 1995 and was done in 1998. So at that time, 25 year old, I really understood, I think, <laughs> what is facilitation? We were coached by facilitators, Art of Hosting. Those who formed Art of Hosting were part of our Toke Müller and Monika Nisein, uh, we worked with David Isaacs and Unita Brown from the World Cafe. We bumped into Peter Senge and Bliss Brown. So already at that time, we were, we were really in, influenced by a lot of, of those, I would say, very skilled facilitators. And we had an exam in process facilitation. So um, from that time, I was saying, this is what I am. I'm here in the room to help something move forward and I have different tools in my toolbox. I can be in the front of the room, in the back of the room. I can be a supporter in the middle of the room. And we bumped into also at that time, David Sibbett and The Grove from uh, Graphic Facilitation Founders. And I just jumped right into that as I, I've always been visual and having the visual support what's going on in the room Well, so what I, that's where I then connected with the, the visual facilitation as a core element of the dialogue in the room. Maybe that was the long answer, but I think since then, and then for then 20 years more, uh, a little bit more, it's been the track that I've uh, walked down on and being part of since that time, this big network of uh, visual facilitators and graphic recorders based out of in the beginning California. Now it's a very global growing movement. Wonderful. And I would be curious, did your definition or understanding of what facilitation is change over the last 20 plus years? Yeah, luckily, I think. <laughs> I think when we, when, when, uh, ha haven't experienced a lot of spaces, both online and, and face to face where, things go wrong and things work and you're helping someone move forward and you're not leading, but you're helping them find themselves. There's a lot of things that you, I think I've understood works better than others. And also that are ways to try to become, uh, refine the way we think. So one big change for me was supplementing this very hands-on education with a, a master's degree. So after that uh, chaos pilot education, I took a master's degree in adult learning and organizational learning and dived into how do you set up learning programs? What does it mean to help 
adult learners will learn something new. And also then the second part of that education was organizational learning. What is it when a system learns? Like, mm. Who has made theoretical definitions of the learning organization? Again, bumping into Peter Senge and system thinking and also Nicholas Luhmann on social systems. Mm. And that gave a whole sort of a way to speak about organizational learning and group learning and individual as something, three different things. So I think that gave me and my thesis partner, Carsten, we, we then tried to formulate and refine a way to say what happens when a group enters the room and you, how could you actually talk about that the learning of the group develops? And the hard thing when it's an ac academic exercise is, is it becomes with Nicholas Luhmann, it becomes a way of looking at what is it that's happening of communication? That's actually something different from what happens in the brains of people, the thoughts and the thinking. But what is it that, how do we look at what the communication, what is being said, changes and develops in a way that we can say that there is group learning happening? And Peter Senge had a sort of an approach to group learning. And uh, Gergen also did. And Lumen also helped us then say, okay, well, communication and the way it based on itself, continually is enabled to handle more complexity in patterns and structures. Well, that then came to be and that the visuals, something that's up on the wall that represents the group's communication, really made the coin drop, I think, on my behalf and say, okay, why am I standing in the room creating a visual scaffold or learning arena for the group and helping the group map in a systematic way stuff up on the wall so that the group really sees and communicates better, more focused and reaches something of a something clarity uh, that helps it move forward. So my perspective over the years definitely changed when we tried to build a method that could make it manifest or more tangible so that we as facilitators can, you know, not only sit in a room and have conversation, And I think everybody who facilitates, they know of these exercises where you try to synthesize, grab what's been said and present it back to the group and then ask a good question about how does this move forward? Well, if you support that with something of a visual structure that, that helps the group see it, it's easier to handle and touch and therefore it can help the group. It can also do the complete opposite. So I think my way towards changing and understanding the facilitator role and also the visual facilitator role has these two uh, legs of the practical and the more theoretical approach. And then has come 15 years plus of just experiencing, testing, you know, being in the room and, and, and seeing when it goes wrong and what works well and, and definitely also uh, what you shouldn't do. And I would love to dive and I we'll dive into that and pick it up. But I think before that, I would like to, just to clarify, how do you see the difference or how would you define visual collaboration as opposed to visual facilitation? Just to make sure that we no. are, the audience knows and that we know what we're talking about. It's been a constant question, I think, for those in the field who add the visual to the facilitation part. And I think uh, I've heard some of the, your great podcast and, and those things of different kinds of facilitator roles are important to figure out what kind of facilitator am I? And when you add the visual, it's the same thing. What way do I think of and use the visuals? So one way is that I stand as a practitioner up at a wall or a digital wall and I listen to what's going on in the room And I graphically put representations of what's going on up on the wall. That becomes a reflection that those who are sitting in the room can then be inspired by, provoked by, or use afterwards or during in the way they want. And that would be, in my world, graphic recording. And in the field of graphic recorders, I think there's a lot of talk about, is that also facilitation? Or if it's not actively used by whoever is running the meeting, How do we define if it's facilitation or not? Because any picture on itself could say that it facilitates a meaning making in the one who views it. But then we would, I would jump in to say, well, the visual facilitation 
uh, where you actively use the visuals as artifacts to help the group move forward, where you help the group see something, but you also help the group create visuals that becomes part of a larger system understanding where, where the visuals are catalysts and process elements for helping the group reach consensus. And then, so that's that would say visual facilitators would be those who are actively thinking through a meeting with using the wall spaces, any piece of paper, anything, and the participants to create the visual material in order to actively use it more or less interwoven in the process to help the group reach a result. And then finally, visual collaboration. It's a way in which everybody in, in, in concert brings on visual artifacts and visualization, not necessarily drawing or posting it, but visual thinking into the room as a core structure and foundation of the way we work together. And the reason why we think visual collaboration is on the rise and is really something that's going to, to hopefully be applied or thought about much more is, is because we are moving in a, in, a, in a world of fast pace, increasing complexity, and visual collaboration, if you think we need a visual collaboration environment with visual facilitation, graphic recording, because the system is so complex that we need everybody to be on board contributing to that space that we're in, because that will help us become agile, see a system and everybody having everybody's contribution, acknowledging that people can contribute into this shared result. Plus the visuals are process oriented, not the end goal in itself. That was the three ways I would, uh, I would say. Thank you for decomposing it. And the one thing that pops up my mind is, or the question, and I, I talked to a few visual facilitators already, and the power of visuals and metaphors. But then, do you think that we can avoid getting lost in translation when we use visuals? Because I think as much as we can use the same words, but mean something different, I assume that we can use the same pictures and see something different. So how would you deal with that? Well, I think the best way to go about sort of this lost in translation is, you know, if we do a favorite exercise of ours, it's really up to the individual to figure out whether that gets that person or if it's a group, that group lost. And, and there will always be a, a discussion back and forth of when you put your pen to the paper and you try to take what's in your mind and put it into an image, will that create clarity for you because you deselect a lot of stuff and you add your thinking into an image with text and image? When you then see your image, are you then one? happy with that's a good representation of your thoughts or are you not happy? And some would have a critical voice say, I can't draw what's in my mind. That's just not, you know, so lost in translation, that, that stumbling block of I'm not drawing what I'm having in my head. I don't want to do this. This is not right. And then you stop. <laughs> and, and then there's the other thing is like, yes, this is what I mean. This is a good sketch or a couple of scribbles on the paper that my inner voice might be critical towards the artwork. But it's a very good artifact with which I can now quickly convey to somebody else my thinking. So I'm sped up in translation. I'm not lost. I've really focused my thinking. And that means I've also focused and strengthened my communication. And if we're good at it together, we've focused and strengthened our collaboration. And the exercise, you know, uh, the exercise that I would have everybody think through and we often use is like, okay, Let's say we sit with a piece of paper and on the one side, you draw a person. So on the left side of the paper, you draw a person standing on a line. That could be a stick figure or a person standing on the line. On the other side, on the right side, you draw again a line and then you draw a person. Maybe the stick figure has his or her, uh, their arms up in the air. And then there's a gap in between those two people. And then above the gap, we have a bridge or we have an arrow. Now, what we would ask people to do is make this drawing, please, and then tell us about how are you today? Where are you today on the left side? 
with your skills in visual facilitation or your digital skills or something else? And where do you want to be? And then write something about what that person is saying and doing on the right side. And maybe illustrate it a little bit of when you achieve a result that what you want with your visual facilitation skills or digital skills, what does that then look like? And in the gap, please put some lines or show something of what is it that's preventing you from where you are to where you want to be? What's the gap? And illustrate it a little bit of what is it? Well, I can't draw or I'm, I don't have enough computer power. It's something external to me. And the last question is then uh, on the top is, okay, so what are the, what's your strategy towards? So you draw a couple of uh, elements of this arrow and you start saying, in order for me to get from A to B, here are three things that would be my strategy. First, I need to overcome my block or then I need to train a little bit and experiment. And then I need to show to others so I can get feedback in order. And I'll do this iteratively. So I then I arrive at where I want to be. Now, if you make such a drawing, and then you can ask, did this get you lost in translation? Did this help your thinking? Did the drawing itself become an irritation to you because it wasn't working for you? Or did it really help you in clarifying some thoughts? And then you were, next time you would say, okay, I want to do another drawing like that because now I know. And it has really helped you move upwards in your thinking and clarify something. And that then goes to groups. We could do the exact same, and we often do. We draw a group on the one side and a group on the other side, and then we ask them to agree on where they are right now with whatever skills or and where they want to be and how they could overcome their challenges. And again, you could ask the question, as a group, if you were standing at the whiteboard doing this drawing together, were you lost in translation or were you supported? And some would say, I, I can't, you know, some people, and but it's few, I can't compute some drawing up there. My brain just doesn't see it. It's noise and, and, and disturbance to me. But most people would say, this is really helpful. We could point at the whiteboard with this. We could draw and we could sketch and, and, and put post-it notes. And it would help us understand and see what we as a group mean. So that this way of working would be visual collaboration when it's the group because it's it's an artifact on the wall based on four different questions set up in a visual framework that could help speed up, uh, you know, help us talk to this together. But that doesn't mean that if somebody fills out the pen, takes the pen, draws something that's really not representing what people are saying and draw something provocative, then it can sidekick and you know just like you and i now you speak german and dutch i speak danish and english but we speak english together but it could be that our vocabulary makes us just get you know lost in our translation the same goes with visuals and and it has the same issues as if you don't have the grammar right or if you're using a language that's actually not right or productive or seen as the way to go in another culture's language, you might have big problems. We can talk about big problems later. We we'll definitely try that. And I can totally understand and see your point because I think the effort to put thoughts onto a piece of paper in an image requires such a simplification or synthesizing of our thoughts especially if we're constrained because we cannot draw very well. So myself, I am a bullet point thinker. I think in bullet points, it really costs me effort to, to draw something. And I think that it would actually help me think if I would just overcome this voice in the head that I cannot draw and that it's too complicated. And with this, I would just say we agree that, 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 that right now, whoever's listening This little exercise we've put on the website that follows our supplement website for this podcast. So if you want to try to do this, now, no, we shouldn't do it right now, but anybody listening, if you go to academy.biggerpicture.dk slash www for workshops work, then there'll be this exercise that you can see and you can test and try it on yourself and, and actually answer the question to you. 
if this is something that becoming a, a stumble block for for you or if it's helpful and and, and there, there are some other there are some other exercises too uh, plus things that can get anybody across this this stumbling block or this that might happen and it doesn't happen a bit but on the other hand once you've understood that it's really you know now if you have put up a piece of paper miriam you you would you would easily easily sketch because you easily as a facilitators like everybody we all go up to the flip charts and we make our bullet points and and the thing is like if if you just add any facilitator you just need to list 10 words that's your main field you take your slide decks that you use or your documents and then you circle the the 10 to 20 most words that say the most about what you're trying to convey and then you do a quick brainstorm exercise where you sketch out, you know, with 10 lines and a piece of paper, you, you try to visualize those 10 to 20 words. And just by doing that, you've given yourself a startup vocabulary that next time you, Miriam, go, go into uh, on the flip chart, you're thinking, well, I, I do my bullet point and that's fine. And I'm just adding because now I have some small symbols or icons. I just add that little stick figure or that little banknote or that little flip chart drawing because it's just a box with a couple of lines and then you you've changed the way that flip chart computes to the brain in the brain of your audiences anyway that that's uh, that, that's what i think and is, i totally plus one that and i must admit since i facilitate online and i use mule there's this plethora of icons that I can just search and then I can find the visual imagination that I had in my mind and just put it there. So I'm much more visual now. Yes. I can cheat a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that is uh, that, that, that's one of the advantages of the big, uh, immense databases of icons that we can use. And that, that helps when you don't want to read five sentences. Yeah. But as a wordsmith, the facilitators are, there's a headline and then there's an icon. And we would, of course, say that it's a good first start because, <laughs> because there's just something magical that we're experiencing right now in the, in the digital space is that when we're so 2D and we're sitting in front of each other and somebody like I could do now, but nobody can see it, I would put on a post-it note. You know, I would I would put on uh, I would draw a simple sketch and I'll just show you what I'm doing now. I'm showing you the the handmade sketch. If you get a little bit of training in this and you start sketching and you put hand drawn icons in, you can just take one of the icons you can get from Mural or Mural's databases. But if you have it as a as a vocabulary and you in those programs, you can also sketch. That makes some of this very uh, digital surface stand out and become more human, a little bit analog, very refreshing in this uh, these Zoom fatigue times. Yeah, and it's funny that you're saying it because just yesterday I hosted a workshop, a crafting workshop, and we were crafting analog props, so little signs that we can show into the camera. And yeah. I've been using them perfect now for yeah half a year, I think, and it's wonderful the kind of little spark of joy it creates without interrupting because it's just a sign you hold into the camera it's handmade so yes dear audience please follow this advice use analog reactions hey since you are listening to this podcast i was wondering whether you get enough opportunities to exchange practice and experiment with other facilitators have you heard of the Never Done Before Facilitation Festival? It's a 24-hour global event that is co-created by its participants and delivered by some of the most popular workshops work podcast guests. Visit neverdonebefore.org for more information. Use the code WORKSHOPSWORK to get a 20% discount. The festival starts as soon as you join. Now, back to the show. When I listen to you and how, what visual collaboration is, and I definitely see the benefits from that, but it sounds as if you require the group beforehand. So you do have an obstacle before you can actually start working on something. So imagine you have a, a team, they want to work on strategy, innovation, whatsoever. So 
you can only start once you got them to the point where they actually feel comfortable with communicating visually. So how do you get them up to speed? Because otherwise you would need two workshop days instead of only one, because you first need to train them in this new language. Yeah, how it's so easy when we are all into the visuals and I'm probably a little bit biased with visuals. So I would always invite people to draw, but I would, and I would always invite people to the leaders or those in the front of the room from the organization to, to lead the way and show that it's, it doesn't need to be perfect. But I know it's easy to say, because if somebody would walk into the room in my organization and would ask me to just stand up and sing, I would run out the door because I don't like singing. It hurts. Like I, I really don't want to sing. Others love it. The and they've audience. done it all their life. I would, I would say, and then, but if that kind person would, would invite me up and see that the leader would say, and say I just, I'm just doing the drumming here, or I'm just doing the boom, boom or something. <laughs> and, then, and then I could see that I'm part of this and I can do a simple thing. You know, for, for people to be asked to draw some, it's like returning to kindergarten or preschool, which is childish and something that's not connected with pleasure. So I think what we try to do a lot when we enter an organization or we prepare for a workshop together with those who need a conference or a workshop, we just lead the way and we don't lead the way with intimidating, very beautiful, finished. That's not what it's about, but we would sketch up an idea on the flip charts, on the whiteboards. And we would gently talk about that if you want your, if you want your messages to stick or your thoughts to just come up on the wall, write a word, but just add a little bit of what does it look like? And then, and then if the, the project leader or the main lead also says, okay, here's, so here's how I see it. And that person is not afraid to show that here's a couple of things. And maybe we've been helping them, those who are running the, the conference or the meeting or the project, that we've, we've helped them find 10 or 20 visuals that support some of the things that the conference is about. So they, with ease, go up and draw, again, nothing that's beautiful, but just a couple of visual representations, a sketches. Then it becomes a, a lighter way into, ah, we can see it works. Out of the groups, you know, just asking people to draw a smiley of their thinking. Everybody knows smiley, and it's the same basic strokes. So, And then they're on board, and they can see that when they talk about the smiley to the others around the table, the conversation changes a bit because there's an artifact that they can point at. Or if they, you know, if they just are encouraged to draw 10 lines representing their mood and they see that 10 lines crisscrossed can actually communicate an abstract way of having like whatever a mood is. So those are our ways to go into it. Another way that we think, and I think every facilitator knows this when when certain people stand in front of the room and they have their 50 slides or 30 slides, there's a lot of words that are just in organizations today, they're just pushed out and nobody knows what they mean anymore. So in some of those initial prep meetings, when you as a facilitator need to help them see what they want to get across or try to understand how they're seeing the world, we very often have this killer question, like the super Super question of, well, what does that look like? You mm. want your your Literally. you want your front, frontline <laughs> employees to be agile? Okay, they they and they have their values. Like, what does it look like? And how does it show up in the world in daily behavior? And if this is what they're doing today, but you want a transformation to happen that in the future does that you survive or that you thrive, well, what does it look like with this new way of working? in the office place or the daily behavior? And what does it not look like? How does it translate into that change? And, and then so often people become challenged because they have to become concrete. They have to talk about that. Is, this is my vision. And my vision can't be fluffy words with no meat on. And if we then look at, well, how, to, how do we sketch those and draw help them draw out those essences of what is crucial that people understand or that people talk about. And we keep it in a visual language that's simple enough that it doesn't suddenly become detached from what everybody can draw or can use. 
Of course, we can always also bring in someone who, because they need to sit and concentrate on their thinking, not on their drawing. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense that they have the stumble blocks where they say, but I, I, I know what I'm saying, but I, I, when I draw it, like it takes me 15 minutes and then the, the thing is gone. We can't spend two days together. We need someone. Can someone please take this sentence and come with 10 different sketches? I'll know which one it is, but I can't produce the sketches. I, I can only draw that same person 20 in, in 10 different positions, but it doesn't get the message across. And I love what you're saying, because I was thinking of the typical examples of company values like transparency and trust. And if with transparency, you come with a window, which is transparent, it doesn't say anything. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Instance, especially when we talk about transparency a window, does it mean that all the salaries are transparent, that all the data is transparent? Yeah. Trust, if we just have two people with a heart in the middle, what does that mean? That they cuddle all day? Maybe. Yeah. So I love that. And I think that it also, and this might be the a way where it can go wrong. So I would be interested in your experience. For instance, when we talk about leadership, I think this can then sh tell a lot about the company's culture. So if you ask someone to draw a leader, I guess most would come up with a man in it or a figure in a tie. And then you have more and more leaders who show up in t-shirts. And of course you have female leaders. So to what extent can visual language be biased? And what is your experience that the group then talks about topics that are actually hitting the core of culture and values that are brought forth through the visual part of the collaboration? I think that's a very fine, difficult, never-ending minefield. So, but when it is a minefield, you of course have to tread very, very, very carefully. But the thing that if it's important, let's say in some organizations, it doesn't really matter. You know, the favorite story of, of Danes would be that in Greenland, there's these, I don't remember if it's 13 or 10 different definitions of snow. And normally we would just talk about one kind of snow. So in our environment, uh, where I'm normally have my everyday, it doesn't, there's not, there's three different kinds of snow. So it doesn't matter. And it's not going to ruin the conversation. But if it's really important, you know, we, we work with Institute for Human Rights. We've had people from, from the LGBT uh, community into our trainings. And some of those conversations have been really interesting because at the core is this talk about we need a new language. We need a different way of looking at, at the, the way we talk about gender. When we talk about diversity, it needs to be more than the three main ones. It needs to be all 13 different different kinds of diversity where gender and religion is just one of them. And the more we understand that, that if we want to display a use of wording, but then what does it look like as then it becomes really interesting. How do we translate that? And how can we come up with icons or visuals or, or shared understandings that actually helps people jump into this minefield And, and not get pushed away, but becomes involved in it. And one of the key things is this continuing this part of the, you know, it's not about, well, it's about the visual, but it's not at all about the visual. Mm -hmm. It's about the process of making visuals that helps us create meaning. And then you map something or you try and see, could this be the, the way to, to draw out, to, is this what we mean when we talk about diversity? Is this what we mean when we talk about history and who did what in a historic view? And it, 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 it can, of course, just blow up everything because then you have people standing and shouting. But at the least, drawings will help people stand and shout at the image. And it becomes, a, it becomes a, you know, it, uh, this is a lightning rod. Instead of the, the, the people talking at each other, it might be that they're actually talking at that image where the, that misunderstanding at place. So it's, mm. it, it can mediate. So even in these difficult situations, the visuals can become this dialogue piece that mediates this tension that there can be around certain topics. 
But of course, it, it's the matter of who is having the pen in the hand as well, who asks the question and how is this mediated? And also facilitated, I guess. Yeah, so yes, it's yes. then in the hand of the facilitator to ask the question, okay, is it really important now to discuss about the dress code of the leader? Yeah. Or can we just talk about leadership and agree to put a crown on the head? Yeah. Which is so abstract, but everyone understands it. Yeah. And then, and, and so and then it's 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 inviting in for we're using iconography here that lends itself to meaning that made sense some time ago. And we need some of that, but we also need to be aware that this iconography that we're using, it can also point to the future where it might not make sense to you now, but if we invent new icons for diversity or for different technologies or for things that will happen in the future, it is actually a part of our thinking together about inventing and creating a language that works. An example we've had, we work with the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation, and of course it's a problem that The one generation draws a TV with an antenna on top and kids don't even know what that is and phones and all these different things that, that it doesn't make sense that we have a save button that's a floppy disk. It's just not working, but we know why. So it becomes a, even in a more, more and more digital space, it becomes important to create icons that gives us an understanding so we can grasp, and that's like really in the way it's the wording, grasp what this is about. Because we as humans, our, our language in any culture is so much based on the way we have navigated in the real world, in 3D space. We understand the world through the way we walk around in 3D and touching and holding on to these artifacts are the way we grasp it. And when everything is then suddenly digital, it becomes a little bit harder. So getting this thing in place of figuring out what, what could these abstract things, what could they actually look like? How do they show up in the world for us? That, that's, well, I think I'm jumping into another, another area. Yeah, but fascinating. Thank you so much for clarifying this. Um, I feel very inspired and <laughs> enabled to grab a pen and a sticky to do some drawings later. And I would like to come back to what you mentioned before, that it can go terribly wrong. So let's start with the intro question. What makes a workshop fail? I've been thinking what kind, and it's, I, I love to hear of stories where it really went wrong. So here's a story from my side. And those who were involved, they, they pretty well know that it went wrong. And I think there are many reasons why it went wrong, but a big reason was the way I turned up in the room using visuals. And there are many, many different angles to it. But I was, I was at a conference with Otto Sharma and a big group of people gathered for three days to go through the Theory U. I think it was four days. And me as a support facilitator, where there, I had a role with the visuals, the thing that wasn't clarified in the beginning was what exactly what role I was bringing into a known concept. But everybody was happy about that there will now be a good chunk of visuals supporting this event. We also had a, an agreement that, that this could be good to introduce to the participants, that they could work visually themselves. But the thing that was not clarified, and I hadn't really, I think, understood, was how and when in an existing process this would work. And the team who were conducting the normal were also not really aware of how I could introduce. So the introduction came in three steps of getting this group of 50 people to create visuals and having a way to go about it. And the second was to introduce some examples of what a visual language for Theory U could look like. And the third was sort of a, here's how you can use it to take action. So the, the part that went terribly wrong was just about don't introduce visuals at the wrong time in a process. And if you know the theory U, there's the bottom of the U where you're sensing. And in a process where you're thinking and sensing, to make something tangible and concrete is not the thing to do. So the moment of being in a space of not really making anything tangible, that was where people were asked to draw some of those thoughts. 
And maybe I'm overinterpreting, but I think that it's fair to say that by doing it at that exact moment in that kind of process was the wrong thing to do. And there are many other things, but one of the things that I learned from it was that that when we're having something and you're in a conversation, or it could be when I'm in a conversation with my daughter or my son, it doesn't help to say, okay, what you're saying right now, try to make a visual of that. And they're not even done with the thought process. And, and by forcing that or trying to do that, instead of going and in, flowing into a direction of thinking and having different thoughts, suddenly being pulled in to say, what was it you just there thought, put it on a piece of paper. It sort of takes you, you, you can see your thoughts and your good thinking flying away because suddenly you're You're asked to put into concrete one of your many different thoughts. And by choosing that thought at that moment, it's not finished, but it becomes finished because it's it's grabbed in a visual. And so facilitation-wise, helping the thought process of people in this kind of uh, just didn't uh, serve the overall. So that was where I think my facilitation with the visuals, getting people involved and giving a language completely failed. It's been a painful experience. (laughs) And I think if if anybody who has been there knows it, it, it served certain purposes, but it definitely also caused some concern in terms of what really happened here. Was this articulated? It was articulated in the design team, and we had a conversation about what really happened here, and this was not the right moment. And it had a, a profound impact on some of the conversations we then had in the follow-up work. And I also think it was a good learning for, for me, for sure. And I think also for the, the hosting and design team about really understanding where that this kind of, of way to use the visuals. And I think was not the right thing here. I think that there, a part of this is also there are different ways that different visual practitioners use visuals. And in, in where I come from and the way we work, it's very much about communication. So it's very concrete to try to get it into, and it's not abstract. I know, uh, and Kelby Bird that works a lot with with, uh, the Presencing Institute uh, has a whole different approach that I also think is very powerful. That's less, in my view, it's less about communication, but it's much more about flow and another kind of facilitation. And each of those approaches have their strengths at different times. Thank you for clarifying that. And I wonder what would have been the best moment for you then? Because I think starting with it also takes the flow apart because then you make it about the visuals and you first teach them. It's like starting a workshop with housekeeping. (laughs) So would you then introduce them even before the conference starts or after the intro? I think we are probably not the right example because when we as consultants go out and work, we make it as an integral part that when we work, we are visual and everything in the way we design and set up the digital spaces or the, the workshop spaces, it is visual. And, and it's like saying our language is visual, is supporting the conversations with visuals, and you're part of that language making. So for others to say, when is the right time? I think it really depends on any time people sit and do group work. Sometimes facilitators bring in a host to help the conversation move along. Other times facilitators bring in a graphic recorder or a visual, uh, a visual person who is supporting the team in visualizing what they're talking about. And then a third thing is to actually introduce and say, in order for you to do really good group work in this group, you could, you could with, with an advantage, you could use the visuals because usually in groups, conferences, and so on, and there's report back and people need to, in a short amount of time, convey their messages. It often helps the groups to get this, what they want to present in a very clear format that is not just text, but it has some kind of visual elements. But then you say, well, how do they best do that if they're, they need to scale up a little bit? Does it take over as a, you call it housekeeping or is it there's too much emphasis then on this is our way of working? But I think it's the same. In the beginning, people weren't used to doing group work and group conversation, taking rounds. So how do we conduct a good conversation, taking turns, the way we speak to each other? You know, what's a good way of having a conversation at the table? This is just one more. What's a good way to sit down and do your work uh, here or when you do, st- if it's not a conference, but it's, it's a, 
a new way of conducting Monday meetings or Kanban meetings, well, you learn a different a methodology for doing just these meetings in another way that has been decided is a more fruitful way. And that is a little bit of a learning curve for, for people. You know, and I say, if, if we, you and I do a workshop next week and, and we decide that we do it in Mural or Miro, we will need to get people either to accept that somebody's texting and drawing for them while they talk and they can see the shared whiteboard space, or we would need to give them a little bit of introduction to how they navigate so they don't stumble into this digital space. And then it's like, we know it. If people don't know how to do Zoom, they're not really like, you know, they have a challenge. They need to be there. And if they don't know how to use the virtual whiteboard spaces, they will tear apart or stumble across the digital post-it notes. And, and that needs to be catered for. It's good that people have a chance to get onboarded into the way we work together. Perfect example. Thank you for that. And that's maybe the beauty of now having been forced to online collaboration that, yes, we introduced all these whiteboards and we have to onboard the participants to feel comfortable with using them. Exactly. And then the, the next step into a visual language of drawing is actually not that big. I like that. What I would do now is to first help participants before the workshop starts to get comfortable with Mural with a video and a little separate exercise. So yeah, yeah, perfectly applies to what you were saying. And I'm only now making the connection. Thank you. We've had some wonderful participants in the courses. So we've, we've been, like everybody, forced to do our trainings online. But the great thing is that the digital spaces makes the, it's more easy to set up a room and then do something. But it's been a very interesting journey into the dilemmas that we're facing. So you and I are sitting with great connections, one or two devices, and we might know technology. But we've had coaches and psychologists on board who are used to sitting with people, reaching out, being able to touch, sense what's going on in the room, and definitely not digitally savvy, and therefore suddenly cut off from the main thing that they do so well. And then we also have organizations running one team's meeting after the other. And again, it's the digitally strong who suddenly have either designed the, the structures of the tools we're using and therefore not really have the more soft, let's say, soft part of it. But then it's also those who are really good at these meetings suddenly run them. And those who are very human, not tech, are struggling to find a, to get into that role And we're all struggling to find new ways in this, but there's just something about figuring out ways in which we in these digital spaces can do that kind of housekeeping. And I wouldn't call it housekeeping. It's just onboarding. So we're, we're more free to be who we want to be in the best part, show up as the, the best possible way. But when we think about it, the learning that this has all brought us is when we go back to physical spaces, There's a certain way of doing that people have been cultured to do in their organizations, or we've learned over the last 20 years of how you do workshops and how you facilitate. And these are the things that you do. And in some cultures or in some organizations, that's just not the case. So you come in with a way that's so alien that it's not being aware of how alien is the method that I'm introducing is, of course, important so that people can be their versions of good employees or good participants or good leaders. Absolutely. Just last uh, curious question. Have you experienced that a potential client, a lead said, oh, no, that's too alien? Or did you encounter a client and then realizing, oh, no, this will be too alien. It won't work. Yep. I think pl plenty. We can come with a full menu of thing, like ways in which we could improve a conference, an online workshop, or a concept for a specific kind of meeting. And in that, have suggestions to what does that mean for what your, your team, your people would need to be able to do. And do you think they need this, this, or this, step one, two, or three? And then let's just start with step one. So let's say there's a conference and it's online and we could say, do you want, like we can do this and then we onboard people so they collaborate visually in the mural. 
and the client say, we, we think it's better that we get onboarded our team. So when we do the conference, we're doing everything and people are just there and they're looking at the whiteboard and they, they need to do nothing but enjoy. And we're listening and we're, we're visualizing. You know, and the same thing is let's we think this is so high level. These leaders have no time at all. So if they need to be thinking about this and this plus out of their comfort zone, we would get a much speedier, uh, we would get to a result faster if you guys do the facilitation in the group and you do the visuals in a way that they can then react to it because they're not, they're not there yet. And others would say, this is exactly what we need. We need to get people on board and it's going to be threefold purpose of this thing we do. One is to get the message out. Two is to work in a whole different way. Three is then to have sideline skill building of using digital tools and visual collaboration skills and so on. Wonderful. Thank you. If someone in the audience fell asleep after minute two, just woke up and doesn't have time to listen to the entire show again, what would you like them to walk away with? Well, if it's demystifying visual collaboration, then it's the exercise we talked about. And with themselves, draw that gap with the person on the one side and the other side and see how, if it's a challenge uh, formulated as the challenge I wish to overcome, where am I today? Where do I want to be? And then try that and say, does that clarify your thinking? And does that kind of work help you reach something? And after that, try to take it on as a team exercise. Draw something with your team of the one side, the other side on a flip chart or on a whiteboard space in a virtual environment. And then demystifying is like, oh, that's all it is. This is an interesting way to focus the conversation, reach clarity together. And it's a fun, engaging way of doing work together. And if they at the same time then say, okay, I'm just going to do my 10 icons for my work, then they're off to a very good start. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to walk me through it, to demystify visual collaboration. I feel very inspired and motivated to work on my visuals, and I hope that the audience feels the same. I would almost say, why don't we make your 10 words, you sketch your 10 words, and we'll add it into this space and see what they are. Awesome. That's a cliffhanger. I like that. So 10 small icons, that's the key words of your work. You can, of course, always cut this one out, but there's a, send me a two-minute video of your 10 icons, then I'll add it in. And here's how Miriam did her 10 icons, but uh, we'll see. But thank you very much. So thank you very much for having me. And I hope that it was something that's worth listening to. And uh, everybody, again, academy.biggerpicture.dk slash www, but I think it'll be in the... In, in the, the show outline notes. As, as well. It will be in the show notes. So just scroll down and click and join and enjoy. Thank you so much. And yeah, challenge accepted. I will do the <laughs> 10 icons for never done before. I think that's a very good exercise. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, Please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.